Hello uh, on Management TV. My dear guest for today is uh, a psychologist, Robert Hogan, an icon, a, a person who's been shaping the world of, uh, I would say, organizational psychology for more than 50 years. And my question is, Robert, uh, we are now at a conference of um, assessment systems, Czech Republic, and your speech is more aimed on how the organizations behave and what kind of managers or leaders they choose. And basically, one of the most important things I heard in your speech was that 70% of all leaders or of all top managers in the United States shouldn't be at their positions. Why do you think it's so? Well, this is a, uh, there's a, there's all, there's a lot, I'm, my background, I'm basically an engineer. I really believe in data and I really believe in making things run well. And I think the key to a well-run team is a, is a good manager. The data are perfectly clear. 70% of American employees, people in American workforce, 70% of them say they would take a pay cut if someone would fire their boss. People care more about how they're treated than they care about how they're paid. They care more about how they're treated than they care about their salaries. And that's true. And the data are perfectly clear on this, if you believe in data. If you, if you take a closer look at your testing methods. Cheers. <laughs> if you take a closer look at your testing methods, how do you prove that what you actually test and how do people actually behave has a close correlation? It's, it's all life. The world is all about statistics. And it, it, to, do the, to, do this, to do the assessment thing correctly is actually quite hard. Most of our competitors cheat. We're the only, as far as I know, we're the only test publisher in the world who does things correctly. What you to do things correctly is you write a series of items, and you give and you have people answer those items. Then you gather performance data on on those people, and you compare their responses on the items to their performance. And then you have to do that again and again and again until you have a set of items that predicts, for example, performance in sales. So you get a set of items get performance and sales, you compare the items to performance and sales, then you do it again, then do it again, and do it again until you get a group of items that are tightly focused on performance and sales and you know that they work. But, at, but to do that takes a long time and a lot of work and a lot of money. And it's more than most organizations, or more than most of my competitors are willing to invest. They don't want to invest the time or the money to do the, the proper research. Mm -hmm. And we have data on every job in the U.S. economy, every job from janitor to CEO, uh, sh casino dealers, horse track, horse ra <laughs> jockeys, blah, blah, blah. But th so that there's a right way, and it's very atheoretical. You just say, what items from this group predict performance over here? And then, and then once you find the items that predict, then you can talk about the theory of the whole thing. But first you have to have, it's just very analytical, very statistical. They call it big data these days. You find items that predict performance, and then that's how you proceed. Mm -hmm. When you take a look, at your whole life work. What is the biggest thing that changed from the 60s to 2016 or 17, which is going to be, uh, what is the biggest difference in the company management, in the leadership skills? What is there a big change from the 60s till, till now? Um, there are definite changes. I'm an academic. I, I was at a, uni a university most of my academic career. In the 1960s, academics, who are the source of ideas for everything, the academics absolutely did not believe personality existed. They thought there was no such thing as personality, that what people did depended on the circumstances they were in. And that, I, I, I mean, I'm the guy, that was the fight that I had to carry on when I started, was to prove that personality exists and it actually matters. Then associated with that, so no one believed in personality, associated with that, no one believed in leadership. They said, I used to teach the course. The textbook said, leadership is a function of, pers of, of a situation. It all depends on the situation. A good leader here can't be a good leader there because the situations are different. So I'm the guy that made the case that A, personality is related to leadership, and B, leadership really matters. And a good leader here is going to be a good leader here if the job is the same. A good, a good football coach here is going to be a good football coach here. You follow these guys around. They go from one team that's a loser, uh, this guy um, Mourinho, 
uh, the Portuguese, yeah, yeah, he was, he was what, he went to, it was it Chelsea, I think is his first team, they were nothing, he took them to the World Cup, and, and everywhere he's gone, he's taken a team, that's leadership, and, and it's real, but academics and business people didn't believe that, and I don't know why, because it's perfectly obvious, the great general of the American Civil War was a fellow named Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, he was in the Mexican-American War. He didn't do well. After, he went to West Point. After the war, he became a drunk and flunked and failed out. And the American Civil War started. He was living in Cincinnati, Ohio. And the war started and they, were com you know, they, were, they needed officers. So they went to him, sobered him up, and they said, you've had experience in the military. Would you come? And so they put him in charge of just a little unit. Well, he won. He just won. He won. He won. He defeated. So they put him in charge of a larger unit. He won. Then they put him in charge of a larger unit, and he won again. He never, ever lost a fight, ever, at any level of command. And finally, he was in charge of the whole part of the central country, but the main army was in Washington, D.C., and the President Lincoln said, there's this guy out in the middle who's never lost a fight. I'd like for him to be in charge of the whole army. And the guys, the politicians in Washington said, he can't be in charge of the army, he's a drunk. And, and Lincoln said, I don't care if he's a drunk, he'll fight, and he wins. So, but the circumstances, for his name was Grant, is the circumstances in which he was in charge changed constantly, but he was a winner everywhere he went. Here's a rule, winners win and losers lose. What I understand is that you <clears throat> distinguish between politicians, and it doesn't matter if in yeah. politician in the politics or, or in, in business, the business yeah. and leaders. Yes. What is the biggest difference? There's real data on this. One more time, my background is engineering. I I'm, we are a data-based organization. We only believe in data. And most people don't believe in data. They just believe in their own ideology or their own... But data are your friends. You, and so our stuff is... So the data are quite clear. There are people in organizations who rise very quickly, who get rapid promotions and who get rapid pay raises. And then there are people in organizations whose team performs very well. And they're not the same people. The people that rise rapidly are not in charge of high-performing teams. And the people who are in charge of high-performing teams don't rise rapidly. And if you follow them around during the day, they do very different things. People who rise rapidly spend all their time on the phone networking. The people whose teams perform very well spend all their time working on their teams. Organizations don't know who's doing a good job. They only know who, do they, who they like. Who do they like? The guys that are on the phone with them all day. Who do they not know about? The guys who are actually doing a good job. So the big challenge in organizations is to get them to focus on results, pay attention to the guys whose teams are performing well, and ignore the guys who are good at networking. If you take a <clears throat> closer look at the whole system, from the, the elementary school, sec secondary school, universities, MBA studies, and everything, what, you're sa what you say in your work is quite revolutionary because yes. in the traditional model, the companies hire the best students from the MBA schools or from schools or from the special engineering schools. Then they promote them, they make them um, uh, talents, they make them high potentials, then they become managers, and everything just climbs directly on the organization ladder. Yes. Usually the most successful people didn't have to get over any big challenges. Yes. And this is not war, so if the top managers are top managers and they lose their job, they, the company doesn't die, they don't die, maybe they close the door, they go somewhere else, but they have nothing to lose. If you, and according to your work, take a look at a closer what was happening at the warfare, if you lose and you say it, you're you eaten, die. you die, your organization yeah. dies. Yeah. But what the companies should do at the present, and there's no warfare, at least in the organi at the organization point of view, what they should do to change this view, to hire really good people, not the people who are most charismatic, who are the best potentials according to their, the MBA schools they studied, what they should do? I would say two things. First, I think the larger a, a business organization gets, the more it will come to resemble the government. So that in really big companies like General Electric, they'll be indistinguishable from the Department of Defense. And it'll be all politics all the time. And because they're too big to fail, it just doesn't matter how badly they're run, because they're too big to fail. Where leadership matters is at the level of startups, of new companies. And startups and new companies are the future of your business and our business. So that's where leadership matters. So with regard to these big companies, they just, they're just going to have to fail. Uh, because they don't care, you can't reform them, it's not, it'll never be about leadership, it's always about politics, but where leadership really, really matters is in the small startups, and the small startups are the future of your economy. Don't you agree? Yes.
Just yeah, because, yeah. you give in. Yeah. Because, because I mean, I, I run a small business, and if we fail, we just fail. We close yeah. the door. We are not on the, yeah. on the market. That's where, that's where real pressure exists. But on the other hand, um, most of the most of the people who are here at uh, today's conference are people who are responsible for departments, who are the yeah. HR managers. What should they do? They should do things right. <laughs> they should they should do things correctly and try to avoid politics. They should try to reform their organizations from the inside. They should try to promote people based on talent and not on politics. It's hard. If you 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 mentioned that personality decides, and even if somebody is a successful politician, he's still successful. Yes. And you mentioned that winners win, losers lose. Yes. And if you become and you get on the top in politics, it doesn't matter in the organization or the politics. You must be successful. You must have some personality. Training. Real skills, yes, absolutely. I think. Um, I mean, I don't like. I don't personally like politicians, but you have to really admire a. I mean. Uh, uh, Barack Obama, I think he's a f pretty much failed as a leader, but he's a very successful politician, and he has some real skills. He's fabulous on his feet. He can give. That's mostly what they have. It's just they can give a really, really, really good speech. But and, and Hitler, right? he was really good in front of an audience. I mean, he was really good, and I'm sure he was quite smart uh, in terms of knowing how to read people and manipulate things. So, no, real politicians have real skills, but their skill involves building a constituency that will support them for wherever they want to go. You define, as I understand correctly, four most important yes. traits of personality right. for want to become a good leader, right. which is the... First thing integrity. is they have to, they have to be in te have integrity. Yes. You have to be able to trust them. Second is they have to make good decisions. And part of making good decisions is to understand when you made a bad decision and then fix it. And bad decisions are about keeping on when you have a bit more. So they need to have integrity. They need to make good decisions. Third, they need to know something about the business. They need to know what they're talking about. And, uh, and, and my example there is universities. University administrators are failed academics. They're people who failed at the business, so they go into administration, and that's why universities are so badly run. And then the first, fourth thing is they have to have a vision for the future, and it can't be a bullshit vision that they pulled out of their butt. It has to be a real, carefully consulted, you know, here, here's what we're good at, here's what, the circuit, here's what the opportunities are, here's what the competition are, this is what we need to do this way, you know, and that's, that's a proper vision, is a, way to the, a successful way to the future. And it's not something like Donald Trump saying, we're going to win again. That's not a vision, that's just an empty statement. A real vision would be tax reform, doing this with the military, building relationships, restoring a proper, you know. Anyway, a vision is a strategic statement about the future purpose. It's got to be smart. It's hard to construct a vision as opposed to, we're just going to win again. We're going to be tired of winning because we're going to win so much. If you, you mentioned data. Data is more, most important to assess one's personal reputation because it's the, as you mentioned, it's the, the, the view of the, of the observer, not, not the actor. However, if you, Take a closer look at your data. What percentage of people that have ever come through your test have, according to the data, have the ability to succeed in all four of these factors? Is, is there any? Because you mentioned 70% of the top managers shouldn't be at their positions. So my question is, is there any potential? Is there any percentage of people who can replace them? You know, every, I mean, the thing about personality psychology, it's, we call it individual differences, everything of importance is a normal distribution. And so you talk about integrity, then you talk about competence, and then you talk about decision making, and then you talk about vision, and if you just take the top 10% out of each of those, that's not very many people. Because it's not only the individual factors, it's a combination of all four. Yes. So, and for example, you mentioned Steve Jobs wasn't a good person. He hadn't a good personal integrity because he wasn't much trustful and people couldn't, he wasn't consistent right, in, his, right. in his behavior, which yes. is what I understand. But still, he was a good leader. So maybe, is there any compromising that may add up to some factors and... How do you know that I said that? I didn't say that today. You must have read. I've I've seen it on your video. Well, or it's oh, some, some books, that's yes. very interesting. Uh, that's not fair. <laughs> um, it depends on the level at which people are in an organization. So it's useful. You can make distinction between entry level managers, middle managers, and top managers. Entry level managers need those four things. The entry level managers have to be able to create engagement. They have to get the workforce on board and go forward, and then they implement decisions that come down from up here. So for entry-level managers, those four factors are absolutely essential. 
and so is social skill. For middle managers, their job is basically a pol political job. They have to take ideas from up here and sell them down here. And they have to deal with pushback from down here. And, and so they have to, they're just constantly negotiating. People at the top, what's most important at the top is, 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 is good judgment and a good, and a good strategy. Jobs, Gates, Bill Gates, uh, 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 Be Bezos, Jeff Bezos, uh, the uh, Amazon guy, uh, they all started their own business. They came to the business from the top. All they needed was good judgment and vision. They didn't need social skill. If you, start, if you come into the organization from the bottom and you want to go from the bottom to the top, you need social skill. If you come in from the top and just start the organization, then you just need vision and, and strategy. Which is yeah, something that yeah, yeah. you chose. Yeah, which those, good, which those guys, the Facebook guy, the, the Amazon guy, the, the, they had, you know, they were good about it. But they're unpleasant people. They could, those are people who could not come in at the bottom and make it to the top. They'd never make it because they, because they lack those characteristics. But as you said, they, they didn't come to the organization from the bottom. No, they, they came, came from, yeah, they yeah, parachuted yeah. in from the top, boink, and then they can do what they want. It's but nonetheless, 90% of those guys are going to fail. Mm -hmm. Most of those people are going to fail. It's only the 10% that actually, only 10% of, 90% of all new businesses fail. But I think this is something very natural because when a small company is acquired by some bigger one, the, the top managers from the small company usually get shot. They shot or they just concentrate on the product. Yeah. They, they are not top managers anymore. They are just product guys because they like creating the products yeah. and they don't yeah. necessarily. Do. And, they, uh, and they'll never have a great career in the organization yeah. that acquired them. Yeah. Exactly. Um, is there any <clears throat> field of, or what is the field for uh, improvement? Is coaching? Or is the ability of coaching or, or, uh, or development able to change the individual traits and to make people become more successful or make, I, I'm not, I don't want to say to make from the losers the winners because it's maybe not possible, but <laughs> what, is, what, is the, what is the scale to which the per personal integrity can be improved? Or There's an old joke in psychology. How many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is one but the bulb has to really want to change. <laughs> yeah, so, it, can people change? Sure, but they have to really want to change. And it's usually because they understand they've failed and they're about to lose their career. And unless they see that they've failed and they're gonna lose their career, they won't change. But at that point, it's like, ah, then, then. And what is the greatest motivator? Is it? I would hope it's fear. <laughs> yes, and, and, uh, and to be, <laughs> how to play the devil, how, how do you create this, um, Fear. level of fear within the organization so that you are not fired <laughs> as a manager and you still keep people motivated and, and willing to change at least their behavior for the situation in the organization. You know, the guy to talk to would be Jose Mourinho. <laughs> and I'm serious. I mean, he did, that's what he does well. He said, look, we're going to fail. We're going to, we're going to lose unless we do the following things. So there's a healthy kind of fear, and then there's just fear and intimidation. The healthy fear is fear of those guys out there. Unhealthy fear is fear of the guys in here. You know, fear of the police, fear of the, you know. You need to be afraid of your competition. I mean, you really do, but you don't need, but you, but you need to think that the people inside the organization are the ones you can trust to help you get past it. Did that make any sense? Do you understand what I'm yes, saying? Yes, yeah, yes. you should be afraid of those guys, yes, yes. not these guys. If you're afraid of these guys, you're, you're afraid of the wrong people. Because the, there are the, the two basic tools to motivate people, at least. They, they, they must enjoy something and they must fear of something. Yeah, yeah, enjoy your work and be afraid of going out of business. Exactly, exactly. You, as I understood correctly, in the past you, you, you were in the military. Yes. It's, it's right. Is there a big difference between the organization, a military organization, or warfare? and the, the business unit. Is there such a big difference in, in the behavior, in the motivating people, in the fears? Of course, there's a, the immediate instant death if you do something wrong in, in warfare, but... Well, I think that there's not as much difference as you might imagine, because um, most of the time, militaries are at peace. And they, it, when the military is at peace, they just look like a de, the, gov, the, the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> uh, and most big businesses are so big that there's no sense of urgency and they look like a Department of Agriculture. <laughs> um, uh, and the, uh, Rebecca was telling me she used to work for an agency 
there's a large military base where, where we live, and they were, she, her, she was a recruiting, she worked for a recruiter, and they would get a lot of retired military officers who would want to, so they, in the military, you can, you can retire at age 42, 45, something like that, which is relatively young. And, and okay, now I've, I've had 40, I've had 30 years in the military, and I'm now about 50 years old, and I'm ready, from all my leadership experience in the military, I'm ready for a great executive. And she said they just failed, and, and, and because to have a successful career in the military, you just, you have to do what you're told. And you better, you should, you, you're, you'll be punished if you try to innovate. Uh, yeah, seriously, you know, it just, just, it's just a hierarchy and you just do what you're told. So there's no opportunity for innovation or creativity. And when those guys move into the private sector, when they move into business, they're just, they just sit around waiting to be told what to do. They won't take, they won't take initiative. So that's their, I would say that that's the only real difference I can, I can tell you. If you, if you, if you take a look on the results of your work and different cultures. Actually, let me interrupt you. The way I got started with, I'm the guy who made the case that, that a significant number of existing managers are incompetent. I made, but I, what started me down that line of analysis was a very famous book by an English psychologist named Dixon, D-I-X-O-N, and the, title, the book was published in 1976. The title of the book is The Psychology of Military Incompetence. And I read that book and I said, wow. Because that, that was consistent with my experience in the military. Psychology of military incompetence, and it's an easy step from psychology of military incompetence to the psychology of business incompetence. Also in your work, now you mention a lot this dark side of personality. Can you explain what it, what it means and what it is good for in your assessment tools or in your, in your services? Well, <clears throat> there was a very smart guy who was a friend of mine. His name was John Bentz. It's a German name, Bentz. He was the vice president for human resources at Sears, which at that time was a very successful um, wholesaler, uh, retailer, uh, big retail stores everywhere in the United States. And he was in charge, he was the head of HR, so he was in charge of hiring new managers. And they used, a, they used an IQ test and a measure of normal personality to hire all their new managers. So all the new managers at Sears were smart and had a good bright side. They, they interviewed well. 65% of them failed. 65% of them failed. There's two thirds of them failed. And he said, how can it be that they failed? since we hired them based on a good, on interviewing well and being smart. So he then, he cataloged the reasons for, and he had like several thousand of them who failed. And he just cat made, he said, this guy failed for this reason, this guy failed for this reason, this guy failed for this reason. And he cataloged them and he came up with 11 reasons why they fired, why they, why they were fired. And so character, I mean, if you get failed, you're gonna fail for one of the following 11 reasons. Being arrogant, being too emotional, being a, 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 a micromanager, uh, being a liar, uh, being a, a, a show uh, attention seeker, you know, and not, not being a team player. Well, I read those and I said, those sound like the, the 11 TSM-3 Axis II personality disorders that were right there in the psychiatric handbook. And I said, they line up. So that's, I, that, and, and so I wrote, a, I wrote items and tried to capture that and it's worked out really, really well. There are these 11 reasons why managers fail and that's it, they, and they do it reliably and you can identify that up front. And those derailing tendencies, those reasons they fail, are, are masked, are hidden by a good bright side. So the bright side is what you see during an interview, the dark side is what you see when they come to work, when they let down their guard. And so, the, and the two exist simultaneously, and uh, and you need to penetrate the bright side to get at the dark side, and then yeah. Uh, do you change your testing methods, or is there any new kit in, 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 in the in the your testing family in terms of your new findings or development of your methods? Even with the closer look to the dark sides of the personality or how the, the organizations change or the, the new technology, internet stuff and everything. Is there anything new that is just... Well, you know, the periodic table of chemistry is the same, but new chemicals are discovered all the time. Okay. But they have to be based on that per periodic table. So we have, there's a kind of core structure of personality and then you can adapt that to new purposes. So recently we published a judgment measure, a measure of good judgment. Mm -hmm. But underneath that is, is, our, is our core assessments. Uh, we've just published a new measure of high potential. 
to identify high potential people, but that's based on the, on, on the core assessments. So we take the core assessments, which are like the periodic table of elements, and then we can turn, use those for different purposes. We, we can make new products from those. Uh, emotional leadership or emotional intelligence is a, is a term that is mentioned a lot of times. What, what, what is it good for and how can it be used for the organizations to, to make larger profits or to, to do well? Well, it turns out that emotional intelligence is a concept that I think has been badly under, misunderstood. It's part of popular psychology. Yes. And anything that's part of popular psychology is useless. So the answer is it's, it's a normal distribution, high emotional intelligence, low emotional intelligence. There's good news and bad news at both ends. People who are high on emotional intelligence are calm, steady, pleasant, always in a good mood, handle problems calmly. It's Obama. The Obama. They call him no drama Obama. It's very calm, very steady, very, nothing upsets him. So that's what you get. But what you don't get is any sense of urgency, any drive to make something happen. So at the low end, where you get drive and energy and push, you also get volatility. You can't have them both. If you want calm, complacent, steadiness, you're not going to get any sense of urgency. He never makes decisions. He just move, just move. So pick your money. So if you want something to happen in the organization, you need people with low emotional intelligence. If you want everything to stay calm and happy with no progress, then you need people with high emotional intelligence. It's, a, it's an idea that sounds intriguing, but is, is kind of s silly and poorly understood. But we still come back to these four factors. That yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Still and, and emotional intelligence was not part of those four yes, factors. Sure. Yeah. And uh, is there a way to monitor the real personal reputation? And can it be, maybe can, can this digital outbreak on the internet, or can it be used just to monitor the person's real results or real behavior? Is there any way to just to click? take a closer look what is the real one's personal reputation or business reputation or work reputation? Well, that's a really good question. And I think th th there are three answers to that. This is you right here. You'll have one reputation from your subordinates. You'll have another reputation from your peers. And you'll have another reputation from your bosses. And they're very different. The subordinates want to know if they can trust you. Your peers want to know you if, like yeah, 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 you're not going to outperform them. Yeah. And the bosses want to know if you're useful to them. Because what you mentioned is that people, they hate you when you're successful. Yes, because, yeah. yes they do. The bo your peers want to know, are you, they, they want to know if you're going to outperform them. And, they, and, and, you, and you need to pretend when you're with them that you're not going to outperform them. And then the bosses, bosses want to know if you're going to be good for their career. Exactly. You're going to make them look good. Or what is the real reputation? Or is the mix of all it? Or yeah. how, how can you prove it? Yeah, yeah. You, you well, always have to provide it. it. You have a real reputation with your subordinates. You have a real reputation with your peers. Exactly. You have a real reputation with your boss. So it's a situation yeah. ma management. In a sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that's true. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 you know, who you are depends on who's evaluating you. And those groups change. And also we play different roles in yeah. family, in the, in the business, exactly. so it's a different reputation at home, different yeah. reputation. Yep, exactly. Yeah. But they all matter. They all matter. Yep. Uh, from a completely different point of view, you, how, how, how did the story with uh, Rostislav Benak and the assessment system Czech Republic, how did it start all this story, getting together with, with uh, Rostia and doing business together? Well, I decided early on in the development of our business that we needed people in other locations so that when we develop business with large American multinationals, we could follow them to well, England or to France. Or to, and so I just, just self-consciously started trying to develop business partners. But I only wanted to develop business partners with people who were young and promising and, and, and look like they have, I, I believe in building with youth. I didn't want to develop business with old established companies because because they have no energy, and he's a, he's a you know real dynamic, energetic, <coughs> uh, go get him guy, and, and he was and he's he's really smart, and he speaks all these languages. I have to say, I didn't realize he was going to be as successful as he is. He's 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 an amazing guy, but that was just I met. Oh, and how did I, how do you meet people? How do you meet people? It's all it's it's adventitious, it's accidental. 
I knew a guy in Spain who was really good, a, a Spanish academic, and, he, and, 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 and um, uh, Rasta, Rasta was working with him, and I met him at a conference, and I, I liked Rasta immediately, and I said, let's try this. Does it help me? And he's a lot better now than he was then. <laughs> Which is good, actually. It should be this way. Yeah, he's gotten a lot better. Is it, is it different in different cultures? Do you have to kind of turn your services or your work or your point of view when you work in Japan, when you work in Europe, when you work in the United States? Because there's, other cultures are, are completely different. Yeah, yeah. They, there's, we talk about personality in terms of the bright side, the dark side, and the inside. And the inside is values. Values are what values vary across cultures. So the Japanese value one thing, and the Czechs value something else. And so, yeah. So you have to pay attention to the values, but personality is the same. You see as many crazy people in Japan as you do in the in the Czech Republic. I have one more question. Uh, what do you think that will be the issue in 10, 20 years in the future? What's going to come in the in the in the future that will maybe turn the the companies completely around? Is it The technology or the large number of small businesses or that the small businesses can in a very short period of time completely outcome the big businesses as we see with Facebook, we see it with Google, we've seen it with, uh, with Apple? It's a really, really complicated question and I, and I think my ideas around that are probably not consistent with uh, I think companies like Facebook and, and Google are just entertainment. Sooner or later food's going to matter. At some point, agriculture is going to be more important than fucking Facebook. The basics, yes. I mean, how are you going to earn, how are you going to eat off of Facebook? You know, so sooner sooner or later, you know, the fundamentals of the economy are going to come back. These things are just diversions. They're entertaining, and people spend a lot of money on it. But I mean, really, first, what is it? Uh, 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 Marx Marx line: There is no God. There's only hunger. Well, sooner or later, we're going to be back to hunger. At which point, Facebook won't be very important. So you think the, the big question will be how to deal with the real... With, that gi with this relentless increase in population. Mm -hmm. We're ruining the earth. And we're ru ruining the earth. Fish come from coral beds. Coral beds are dying. When the f coral beds are dying, there won't be any fish. Then how are people going to eat fish? It's, it's, it's uh, uh, Thomas Malthus uh, writing about in the late 1700s. I've always thought he was right. He said, pop, human populations will always expand past the point, carrying point of the food supply. Always. So your population grow, 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 and then they'll crash because they've run out of food. Grow, 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 crash because you've run out of food. We're running out of, there, there's population growth is going to kill us. And so that's the, I mean, that's, I think that's the future. What does the future hold? Starvation and warfare. <laughs> sure. and, what, what? and Facebook won't help you. And what, what can be done? What are you going to do when they come for you? Get on Facebook? Yeah. You have to go back and yeah. either fight for food yeah, or yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, you have yeah. to come to the basics. You have to, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, then, yeah. Then it will I'm sorry, good. that's not a very happy view, but I, I'm right. The population is just going like this. Climate is going like this. Arable, arable land is going like that. Well, we see it on the refugee problem in Europe. We see it, we see it everywhere. But anyway, what can be done with this problem on the organizational level? More to behave more effectively, to treat the resources better, what can be done on the organizational level to, to survive, not only the, on the organizational level, but globally. I mean, it needs to be a value change. People in U.S. organizations are greedy and selfish. As long as people are greedy and selfish, they're going to do what maximizes their profits and takes care of them, and they don't care about anybody else. You need a little altruism, and <laughs> I just, you know, it's going to be hard. Well, it is the first rule of economics that people always behave in their own yeah, intention. Yeah, yeah, and they, yeah. they and, the, and the, the fundamental goal of leadership, they said that for me, there's a moral component to all this. I'm quite serious. There's a moral component. Leadership is about getting people to work for the common good. That's where salvation is going to lie. And what the selfishness principle has now overwhelmed in your business. But effective teams, effective sports teams play for the common good. That's the goal of leaderships, to get people to behave in a way that's good for everybody and not just for leadership. One more time, leadership is a resource for the group, not a source of privilege for the incumbents. But still in the world, you see that the, the small percentage of people who, who control most of the resources, it's that the, the really small number of people control over 80% yeah. of all the yeah, global exactly. resources, which, which, is, which is something that 
is the rea reality. But yeah, yeah. what? And I heard from from Soros, who is the multimillionaire. That George Soros. George Soros. Yeah, yeah. He, he said something that was very interesting for me. He's a smart guy. The rich people must really consider if they want to be hanging on the tree or yeah, yeah. they have less money. I really agree. I think he's right. I really agree. Because because it won't be about uh, losing the money. It will be that they can uh, yeah, kill you. Yeah. They kill you exactly. And eat you. And eat you. <laughs> if they're hungry enough. But still, we are today at the, the conference where we have most managers and people who are. Who are, who are responsible for hiring people and, and training people. What would be your message for, for these people? What should they do in order for their organizations to behave more effectively, to hire the real leaders, not the politicians? What would be your, your, your advice? Simple thing. The simple thing is they need to think about the long-term success of the company, not their paychecks. They need to work for the good of the company, not for their own welfare. And I good luck with that. Robert Hogan, thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Good to have you here.